Well, good morning, Cross Point. If I have not had a chance to meet you, my name is Michael. I'm the associate pastor here, and it is my joy to bring you on the church's uh, senior pastor gets a day off preaching day, New Year's <laughs> Eve message. <laughs> Um, I am so thankful for Dave's bringing of the word each week um, and, the many, and the many elders and preachers we have who step up to help with that. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thinking on this past year has been a joy for me. This is, uh, this is my first full year here at Crosspoint, and so there was a lot to reflect on, a lot of mistakes, um, a lot of, I think, maybe successes, though those are always gods, and a lot of me running around like Sonic the Hedgehog after drinking an energy drink. So I, I appreciate all of your uh, patience with me as we, as we go through this life together. I want to tell you a story. Some of you may know this, um, and if you don't, then maybe this will... Yeah, okay. And <laughs> I haven't had coffee today, so it'll take me a minute to ramp in. In the summer of 1940, more than 350,000 soldiers, most of them British, were trapped at Dunkirk. The German forces were on their way, and they had the capacity to wipe out the British Expeditionary Force. When it seemed certain that the Allied forces at Dunkirk were about to be massacred, a British naval officer cabled just three words back to London, but if not, but if not. These words were instantly recognizable to the people who were accustomed to hearing the scriptures read at church. They knew the story told in the book of Daniel. The message in those three little words was clear. The situation was desperate. The allied forces were trapped. It would take a miracle to save them, but they were determined not to give in. One simple three-word phrase communicated all that. For some reason... People are still not sure why, though those of us who claim uh, faith in Christ would likely say God's intervention, uh, the Axis powers hesitated. They backed off briefly, and what's known now as the miracle of Dunkirk took place. British families, fishermen, they heard the poignant telegraph, uh, the telegraph cry for help, and they answered with merchant marine boats, with pleasure cruisers, and even with some small fishing boats. By a miracle, they evacuated more than 338,000 soldiers and took them to safety. Now, I remember growing up, I was not alive in 1940, I, I remember growing up, though, I was always told and taught there are three things that you don't talk about in polite society. Religion, money, or politics. Awesome. You also all learned this. Um, so we are a church, which means that we break the first one pretty much every week. Earlier this year, we had the opportunity to talk to you all about money. And so I decided, let's round out 2023. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Crosspoint. <laughs> Point. Now, some of you, and I know that, that, that there was a lot of laughter, which makes me feel better. Um, but some of you might have just tensed up a little bit, shifted, maybe got a little excited or maybe a little uncomfortable thinking about politics. I've had many friends and people who I deeply love and respect say things, and maybe you have said this or, or have had others say this to you, that politics don't belong in the pulpit. But I think that there's a problem with this view. Scripture is actually very political. We believe in a king. We believe in a lord. That's political language. What I think we often do, though, is we often confuse politics for partisanship. Politics for partisanship. See, politics has to do with the organization and governance of a people. The church is a politic. In some ways, your homes are politics. Businesses are politics. Partisanship, on the other hand, has to do with this, with there being the idea of a, a particular party whose agenda needs to be presented. This is a, a, kind of a unique situation to, to a governmental system that has party-based system. So partisanship is seeking to promote a particular party. 
But when we look at Scripture from the people of Israel being instructed to create a theocracy, which is a government where God is the reigning uh, ruler, right? There are no human rulers. To conversations throughout their fall and throughout the New Testament of how believers should live when under foreign and oppressive powers, which, spoiler alert, is like 95% of Scripture. There is, scripture is filled laden with political language, conversation, and expectation for believers, most exemplified in the act of Jesus coming in flesh to become the true king of all of creation. Now, why politics, Michael? All right, this is New Year's Eve. We want to be excited. We want to set some New Year's resolutions. We want to feel good about ourselves going in. But the reality is that going into another national election year, I don't know if you guys know that that's coming up, in 2024, um, going into another national election year in the United States, which, again, I, don't, I won't make this joke the entire time, I promise, but I don't know if you've noticed, have been getting increasingly turbulent, increasingly divisive. We're all going to be told by a lot of people in a lot of different ways that there's much to be fearful of, that there's much to be anxious about. And what they're going to do is they're going to offer you solutions, usually in the form of a person or a party platform, to solve those issues. But the truth is that those solutions will always fall short of God's ideal. So instead, I want us to go into this new year ready to stand firm on the truth of Jesus Christ. God made flesh, crucified as the propitiation for our sin, the hope of the resurrection found in his first historical resurrection. So while the world screams at us to be anxious and to drink the snake oil of partisanship and power, I want us to stand firm then as a non-anxious witness. Now many people, when they hear a message like this is about to be preached, they assume that we're going to go to maybe a passage like Romans 13 or, or 1 Peter, uh, which are like some of the major political passages in Scripture. But instead, I want us to turn to maybe some of the clearest examples that we have of how to live as exiles in a strange land. So I want to turn to the book of Daniel. It's in your Old Testament, if, you're, if you haven't been there before. Um, and so if you'd like, you can start heading there. We're going to be in Daniel 3, which should be, if my Bible is correct about aligning with yours, should be on page 760, if you don't know your Bible very well. And that's okay if you don't. I had to learn. Now, it's important to know before I get into this that this message will fall short of many of your expectations for this type of a message. It's just going to. This is because of my limited time. Dave only gave me one, one week that I'm allowed to talk about this. Um, and I want to avoid any Eutychuses happening, so I'm going to keep it to our normal time frame. I'm not going to talk all day. We're not going into a series on politics or on a political theology. Um, next week, we're going to be back in the book of John, continuing through our series, Life in His Name. So I can't cover all of the information maybe some of you would like me to cover. Some of you who are maybe a little nervous are like, okay, good. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you what policies or initiatives to prioritize. Instead, my prayer is that you'll leave today with three things. I don't have points for you. I have three things that I want you to leave with. I want you to leave with an encouragement, I want you to leave with a challenge, and I want you to leave with a warning. So with that in mind, let's head into the text. I'm going to start in chapter 3, verse 8. It's a long text. About 80% of your notes is just this text. So starting in verse 8, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But There are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? 
Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? It's a little bit of a spoiler question there, right? We know the answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So some quick history. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four men from the tribe of Judah who were taken into Babylonian exile and trained up for service in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. They were renamed Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar, and uh, the other three were named, yeah, we just said it like 15 times in the passage, so I figured you guys would remember it, yeah. I'm glad you guys were paying attention. You're there. They went through three years of training for this, along with a number of other, other individuals, um, and it says that in, the matter of, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. They had received God's blessing that they would be seen that way, and so they were, they were well-liked. Chapter 2, there's this story where the king has a fitful night of dreams, and he seeks some of his magicians and wise people to interpret, but he places this really unrealistic ask on them. He tells them not just that they need to interpret his dream, but first they need to tell him what he dreamed. Right? What? I couldn't do that, right? When they're unable to, he sentences them all to death, Daniel hears about it and intercedes for the group, asking the king for more time. And we see the four men then go and pray to God. Daniel is given uh, divine revelation. He's able to describe both the dream and the interpretation to the king, who's then amazed, promotes Daniel to his second in command. And Daniel thus makes these other three guys administrators over Babylon, bringing us then into the part of the narrative today. See, Nebuchadnezzar constructed this massive statue. It says it's 60 cubits tall, which is 90 feet. 90 feet tall. That's like 10 stories, right? That's huge. We don't know if it's of him or of, of, of an image of a god of his choice, but the decree is that everyone will worship when they hear the music, and in so doing, they are functionally worshiping his gods, and these men from Judah refuse. 
So some Chaldeans, we don't know much about them, report them to the king, and it gives us this feeling of almost mindless obedience because when they, when they report him, they almost report like verbatim what his decree is. They have all the instruments listed, and they remind him what the punishment is for it. And this language that's used here where they denounce the Jews and, and these Jews who you've placed above us, right, should suggest animosity. They're not just your overzealous hall monitor, right, making sure that everyone follows the rules. They have some kind of frustration with the Jews, whether it's their meteoric rise to positions of power, whether it's their ethnicity or something else entirely, we're not told. But we get this sense that there's something other than just, he's not following the rules happening. And Nebuchadnezzar, following a long line of kings and emperors, both before and after himself, he commands his subjects to worship the same gods as he does. In many ancient cultures, this is often a deified king or emperor. In Babylon, that wasn't likely the case. But we see him demanding spiritual allegiance as a representation of political allegiance. I command that you worship this. And this might seem strange to us or something that we scoff at in our 21st century ethic, but the idea of politics and religion being a separate institution is a foreign idea in the ancient world. It just didn't exist. Religion and politics were intertwined in ways that would make even many of the fans of the, of the contemporary state and church being the same blush. And honestly, we may not be as far removed from this mentality as we think we are today. But these four Judeans reject the king, and the reader, we get to experience this almost visual depiction of the ferocity of his narcissism. As he has the furnace superheated up to seven times its usual intensity, these men are bound by the strongest soldiers they could find and cast in. This alone casts a compelling narrative for many of us. Perhaps you see your story there. The one lone lover of Jesus or a small group of believers in Jesus being cast into the furnace by those who are opposed to him. I would caution us against relating too much to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think most of us, most of the time, act like King Nebuchadnezzar. Don't we? We construct massive idols in our lives, maybe not a physical 90-foot-tall statue of ourselves or our gods, but we build up these idols of safety or security. We build up idols of money or power or strength, self-fulfillment, relationships, family. And then we get angry or we, we scream or we cry or we shout when people refuse to worship those same things with us. And we cast people into our own furnaces. There's many cultural idols that we have to fight against. Today, I want to focus in on politics. We may not generally make massive statues of our candidates. Though, if you read news recently, you know that there was a statue made. Instead, though, what we do is we plant yard signs. We wave flags from our trucks or our clothes. Right? We wear clothing, proudly display bumper stickers that let everyone know either who we are for sure for or who we are for sure against proudly declaring our allegiance to these partisan saviors. Meanwhile, next to it, we have slapped a, a un, uh, an unkempt, dirty, because it's been there for a while, Psalm 23 bumper sticker, and we're cutting people off in traffic and yelling at them. But it's okay, we don't have idols in our lives. Now, before I go any further, and some of you are like, Michael, please stop, I'm done, I'm out, right? Before I go any further, let me tell you what I'm not going to be saying to you this message. I don't want you to hear this from me. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be involved in politics. It's not what I'm saying. There's a Christian uh, philosophical, theological kind of train of thought called Anabaptism, of which I joyfully consider myself a, a member of in many regards. 
but Anabaptists nowadays often refrain from voting. They pull themselves back from the, the voting and from being politically engaged that way. And if that's where you land, that's perfectly good and, and okay. I, just, I think that that takes our call to be exiles too far. I think it's good and right for Christians to engage with our politics in thoughtful, meaningful understanding and gentle ways. I think the problem is too many of us have been brought into a wrong primary allegiance, specifically a partisan allegiance. We built a giant golden statue and said, you have to bow at this statue. So Nebuchadnezzar casts these three bound men into the blazing inferno. These three men, by the way, who he's been impressed with, right? All four of them he'd been impressed with, but he'd been so impressed with them, and the text says his attitude toward them changed. He was furious, and his attitude toward them changed. And as they're in the fire, the king and his officials are somehow able to see the surface. We don't know exactly how that layout looked. We have some ideas. But they're able to see inside and see what's happening. Um, which, can we just talk about that narcissism for a second? Watching our enemies, our supposed enemies, burn to a crisp. How many of you enjoy watching your enemies get eviscerated on Facebook comment threads? <laughs> Truly, there's nothing new under the sun. All that changes is the medium, the methodology. Nebuchadnezzar is suddenly alarmed, and he asks what seems like an odd question, and I don't know, if I try to put myself in the position of his, his advisors, like my heart races a little bit, because he goes, wait, didn't we throw three men in there? And I'm like, okay, wait, d- did we miss one? Or are there four, like, are there too many? Like, why is he asking? This happened like two minutes ago. He couldn't have forgotten already. We see him say, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, this passage is often used to demonstrate that God is always with us in the fiery trials. Now, this is certainly a biblical truth. I don't actually think that's what this passage is talking about. Let me explain why. I do think it's an illustration of that, right? We can't think of this passage and not think of Isaiah 43. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It is a biblical truth. But we aren't told in this text that the three men from Judah had any idea there was a fourth person in the fire with them. We're not given that information. Only Nebuchadnezzar is shown as even mentioning it. Does that mean that they didn't see a fourth person in the fire? No. But what this suggests is that it's not actually important whether they did or not. Because their non-anxious witness wasn't about them. It was about what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember, asked the question, what God could save you? Some of you ask that question. And when he brings them out, what does he say? Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What God can save you indeed? See, the fourth man in the fire wasn't necessary for God to work his his saving power over death for these three men. He could have chosen to save them and have them walk out unharmed, whether there was a fourth person in the fire or not. The fourth person is there so that Nebuchadnezzar clearly sees the manifest presence of God. I love this church. So here's the crux of the story. Our lives our witnesses are not ultimately about us. They're just not. We're not called to protect ourselves. We're not called to seek after power, political or otherwise. We're we're not called to take over the government. We're called to live lives of non-anxious witness. Because our life is not ultimately about us. You and I, whether you are a believer in God, whether you're somebody who's seeking him, whether you're curious, whether you are, could not care less if there's a God, but you're staying with family for New Year's and they made you come in order to get breakfast. 
no matter where you sit in your faith journey, your life is not about you. Your life, your purpose, the reason you exist is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And here's the truth. We don't need to be in charge of anything for that to be the case. Most of scripture was written by people who were under oppressive regimes. Regimes? Regime. Doesn't matter. Sorry. <laughs> Our lives are opportunities to demonstrate God's glory to others. Most of us were Nebuchadnezzar. We've built idols. We've demanded allegiance. And those who don't agree with us then, we, we cast into the furnace by calling them brainwashed, uneducated, by mocking them, by diminishing the value of Imago Dei that exists within every created person. We block them, we treat them with contempt, we break ties with family if they refuse to bow the knee at the altar of our partisan favorites. Our allegiance is misplaced. And the tension and it is a tension of the Christian life is that this side of eternity is we're going to continue to exist as these little Nebuchadnezzars in what Paul Tripp calls the kingdoms of self while simultaneously being transformed into Christ's likeness to witness God's glory for others. And that is a tension and that is a difficulty. But the historic story of humanity is our constant divergence into this idolatry. Whether it's fear that leads us there fear of the unknown, fear of losing the rights we think that we deserve, whether it's a desire for power or status, whether it's a desire just to feel safe and secure. And we see this all the way back in the garden because Adam and Eve desired to be like God and we still continue every day to try to be like God. We see it throughout the Israelite history as the people constantly turn from God who continuously saved them, continuously redeemed them. They turn from him over and over and over back to the idols of the world around them. We have notoriously short memories. And we're constantly formed by the cultures around us. In his book, Political Gospel, Patrick Schreiner writes that the American church is dangerously close to Israel, who built and worshipped other idols on their hills, all the while continuing to continually going to the Jerusalem temple. Religious belief has not been replaced with partisan belief, but combined with it. We've built idols in our churches. And like King Nebuchadnezzar, we demand that people bow. But what we forget so often, Jesus, friends, don't cheer until I finish this thought. <laughs> Jesus, friends, would not be a Democrat. Jesus, friends, would not be a Republican. Jesus wouldn't be Libertarian. He wouldn't be Green Party. He wouldn't be American Solidarity Party because Jesus is a king. So our call, he's a monarch, and he's going to come back, and friends, the democratic republic or oligarchy or wherever you feel like it's sitting philosophically right now in the United States is going to go away. You're holding on to something that isn't God. So our call is not to seek the advancement of a flawed and ultimately incomplete governmental partisan philosophy. And hear me, that's not to suggest that there's nothing good about these governmental philosophies or partisan philosophies. I'm not saying we throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm saying we put it in its right place, which is under the sovereignty of God. Instead, we are called throughout Scripture to seek the peace and flourishing of the city in which God has placed us. Jeremiah wrote that to the Babylonian exiles that were happening at the same time as Daniel. I just want you guys to understand 
this. This is just for free. This is a bunny trail. I won't sit here for a long time, but here's the deal. Babylon, you think that it's, maybe some of you are sitting here and be like, the U.S. is horrible. We're ungodly. It's awful. We're, we're going to terrible places. Babylon was worse. They're casting people into a furnace and watching them burn to death. That's not to suggest that things can't be better. But keep in mind that there are godly people witnessing in a non-anxious matter in some of the worst empires that have ever existed from a humanitarian perspective. Now, how can we know that partisan politics has become an idol for many Christians? How can we, how can we know that? Um, there's lots of studies around it, and, and I don't really actually want to cite any of them. Um, I just want to look at one recent historical event. I'm sure none of you can guess what I'm talking about. Um, a few years back, we saw relationships fracture in churches around the country, really around the world, but especially our country. We saw relationships fracture in the church. We saw relationships fracture in families, children and parents and sometimes spouses or siblings over political beliefs, over questions of COVID and masking and vaccines. In watching this happen, Dr. Doreen Gray, a pastor in South Carolina, commented on Twitter, people will leave a church over politics before they will leave politics for a church. One and a half hours on Sunday versus 20 hours a week feeding on cable news and in political, um, po uh, political partisans ranting, it's shaping a lot of people's theology for the worse. You are what you eat. So are you eating partisanship or are you eating the things of God? Are you eating from the bread of life? Are you drinking from the water that brings life? Patrick Schreiner again, he says, anger reveals our loyalties. Anybody seen people, or maybe this has been you, some anger over the past few years, specifically around politics and even more specifically around partisan questions. Anger reveals our loyalties, whether we admit it or not. If we have fractured relationships because of politics, we need to ask whether we are placing too much hope in political promises. And hear me, these are difficult topics. It's not just about COVID. It's about everything from immigration to foreign policy to abortion to economics. To all of these things are contentious. And they are important to talk about. And they are important to discuss. But they are not bigger than God. They are golden statues. Not the Messiah. And it can be really easy for Christians, I think, to kind of shrug off these questions. It, it, it feels maybe too sticky or scary out there, so we kind of move one or two, I think, extreme ways. And, and the first way is where a lot of us maybe take this position where we say the Bible is absolutely clear about what our public policy should be, which is rarely actually the case. Just going to, if you need to know that, that is untrue in most instances of public policy. Or they lean the other way and they say, well, it doesn't matter because Jesus is coming back, so why are we even getting involved in politics? Why do we care? And the challenge and the difficulty and the tension is that Scripture has called us to speak prophetically into our country, into our city, into our place, the place where God has put, put us to work for the good of that city. He doesn't say that we have to work that good for ourselves. He asks us to, to, to walk with him, to do the good works which he has prepared beforehand, to align ourselves with him. I think I have one more quote. I think it's only one more quote. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which if you are not familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer's story, this was a man who was a, fan, a, a brilliant theologian, was a pastor during the Nazi regime in Germany, lived most of his life as a nonviolent pacifist. In the, and he spoke prophetically into the churches at the time and told them they shouldn't be aligning with the Nazi party in the way that many of them were, out of fear. And in the process, you can actually see in his writings as he wrestles with this idea of, I feel called in the Christian walk to be a nonviolent pacifist, but when I look at the atrocities 
of the Nazi regime, I don't feel like I can stand as a Christian and not work to, to solve that. And so he actually, a nonviolent pacifist, became a member of an assassination plot against Hitler. I don't say this to commend either one of those perspectives to you, but rather to tell you it's complicated. And it's okay to admit that it's complicated. Easy answers are rarely the right ones. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said in the sermon, Christianity stands or falls with its revolutionary protest against violence. Keep in mind, this is a man who took part in the assassination plot. This revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power, and with its plea for the weak, Christendom adjusts itself far too easily to the worship of power. And this is the story of the Israelites, too. This is the story of, of the early church when Paul was writing them, telling them to not be formed by the, the philosophies of the world around them. Here's the primary question that I see this passage confronting me with, and I, I hope that it confronts you with as well. What God do you serve? Do you serve the little g God of power, political influence? Maybe it's one of the different ones, money, health, safety, security. Do you serve the little g God that, where you have to tell others to bend their knee in order to obtain access to the king of kings? You can't be a Christian and vote Democrat. You can't be a Christian and vote Republican. What nonsense we speak into the world. Or do you serve the God who is, who is present with you everywhere and who has full control over the power of life and death? Read this passage again when they come out of the, of the fire. Do you see how it describes them? They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. Cool. Nor was a hair of their heads singed. I don't know about you guys. I have flyaways all the time. I would expect at least one of those to get singed, right? <laughs> their robes weren't scorched. That's not even part of their bodies. That's their clothing. And there was no smell of fire on them. Anybody been to a bonfire? Anybody ever not smelled like a bonfire after you leave a bonfire? This is God's demonstration of his power over everything natural and supernatural. He controls death, he controls fire, he controls it all. Is that the God that you serve? Do you serve the, the little G God of partisanship that says that the way you protect yourself and your rights and your freedoms and the freedoms of others is by voting a really particular way or do you serve the God who set you free in order that you might joyfully submit yourself to others, governments and individuals alike, in a non-anxious witness of the truth of God, which is that we know that this isn't the end of life, but the prologue? So, what can we do? I told you at the beginning that I'm, I'm praying to leave you with three things, and here's the first. I want to start with some encouragement. I think one of the most beautiful things about Cross Point Church specifically is that in the midst of a country that becomes increasingly divided over the idols of partisanship, we remain a church so devoted to the word, word that there are people, don't look around, there are people sitting in these pews who have voted Democrat, who have voted Republican, who have abstained from voting, who have voted for a third party, because we understand that in order to come here and worship the King of Kings, we don't need to all vote together. And that's a beautiful thing, and it's one that sets us up so well to walk in line with God's vision for unity. Tom Douglas has said this before. I, I don't know if he ever said it from, from while preaching, but that when it comes to unity, we're guaranteed that, which means that the only reason why we aren't unified is ourselves. We're the ones who work disunity in the church. 
So I think it's an incredible thing. And I think that it's something that most people in the country, churches included, will look at and say is less and less possible for, for people who are conservative and for people who are liberal to worship together and to have friendships and to love one another and to care for one another and to encourage one another and to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Most of the country right now would tell you that's not possible, yet we are showing that with God all things are. And I think that, that is beautiful. And my desire is to see that continue to be the case. Second, I want to leave you with a challenge, which is this. That is an encouraging truth. And I want us to lean into it. So perhaps wherever you're at, conservative or liberal, you sit on a, you enjoy being politically involved. You like knowing the, the issues. You like being informed. And I think that's a good thing. Here's my question for you. Do you have a good friend or a above, above um, acquaintance friend who disagrees with you politically, who you are comfortable with having political conversations. It's really easy for us to vilify, diminish, disregard, and just straight up lie about the opposite views or, or differing views when we don't actually have an image bearer who we are friends with and we're caring about on a regular basis who holds those positions. We all have a tendency to straw man Instead, we should be steel manning arguments until we have the ability to really truly understand and explain somebody else's perspective for them. You don't really know their position. You don't know why they vote the way they do. Don't assume you do. Let's take the encouragement of the fact that we sit here on Sunday and worship together and let's remember that church doesn't end when we walk out those doors. We continue to be the church, which means our loving people, whether they vote with us or not, continues through the week. And let's not be afraid. Our, our, our society is telling us, right, the three things you don't talk about, religion, money, and politics. Well, we got religion down. We talk about that a lot here. Money, eh. But the entire country is telling us we shouldn't talk about politics. Just don't do it. It doesn't go well. No one likes it. But that's how we isolate. Proverbs 18 says that the man who isolates is seeking his own desires. Don't isolate. Don't seek your own desires. So be encouraged, be challenged, learn deeply about your brothers and sisters, and finally a warning, um, and I know that you think that this is almost done, but I actually still have a little bit more to go, but I will be done soon, I promise. I learned from Dave, what can I say? Um, <laughs> I, we, I joke with Dave a lot, because both Dave and I have a tendency to, to speak long. Um, as Lee, is Lee here? I haven't seen him. As Lee says, as pastors, we have the gift of gab, so... Um, so finally, so we have an encouragement, we have a challenge, and now finally a warning. The partisan world of the United States is desperately seeking for you to be discipled by them. They're desperately seeking your discipleship. They want you following their brand of news, they want you following their talking points, they want you following being afraid by the things they tell you to be afraid of, they want you to think of their candidates and their people as your saviors. And the church has become complicit in this over the years because the deceptive power of idols is in fact enticing because we do still feel fears and we do still have anxieties and we do still struggle and we do also just have opinions on how we think maybe we could coexist together better, right? We have maybe economic views. Maybe, maybe you're a Keynesian economic theorist. Maybe you're an Austrian school of economic theory. Maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about and that's totally okay. The point is... It's okay to have those thoughts and those ideas and those beliefs. But they want you to follow their views on those. And the church has become complicit in it because that power is deceptive. And so you're going to feel this year, because again, this is 2024. We're going into a national election. Um, I don't have local TV anymore, but I do have YouTube, and it annoys me. So first of all, it annoys me that YouTube has gone from one ad. Well, first, it annoys me. First, first of all, it annoys me that ads happen before YouTube at all. Second of all, it annoys me that now there's two ads before YouTube. In national election years, it annoys me that both of those are political ads. Right? Wherever you go, you're going to experience this pull. You're going to feel the pull. You're going to feel the temptation. You're going to feel the fear. You're going to feel the anxiety. You're going to be like, are, are people taking over our country? Like, I, do, I don't want that to be the case. How do we solve this issue? Are people getting free speech? I don't know. I don't feel like they do. The people that I know maybe aren't. So how do we solve this issue? Oh, this, this person says that they're going to solve this for me. Their, their party agenda is going to solve this for me. And you're going to be barraged with ads for different politicians. You're going to be barraged with angry and hate-filled articles 
that are published about different politicians, and our whole country is going to again fall into this trap of partisan saviorship. Instead, I want us to live as non-anxious witnesses. Spend less time with the news. Spend more time with your families and your church family. Be involved in growth groups. Serve in midweek ministries in the church or in the community. Live like people who believe in the hope of the resurrection of mankind, not just people who say it. So to help with that, to remain in this mindset of encouragement, I have three suggestions as we go through this next year. First, I want you guys to stop watching your news, and I want you to start reading it. I'm not saying don't be informed. I'm saying stop watching it, start reading it. Um, and also read about the same story from multiple sources, reputable sources that span the political spectrum. If all of the things that you're reading or hearing from are agreeing with you, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're not honoring your brothers and sisters on, on opposing political views. You are bowing the knee to an idol. Additionally, watching your news actually does something different neurologically. This is just true when, we're, when you're watching anything, really, which is that your brain actually mirrors the emotions and the things that you're experiencing. So when a talking head or a, a newscaster is getting agitated or frustrated about something, you will start to get agitated about those same things as well. So start reading your news. There's lots of sites out there. I love allsides.com. There's a few other ones where they try to give you a span of... of um, bias, and it's okay, by the way, I just, it's okay, by the way, to admit that there's bias in the world. They have shown pretty conclusively and exhaustively that every single person on the face of the planet exists with bias. It's not wrong to admit that. What's wrong is to pretend like you don't have a bias. Okay, so just know that that's okay. Don't be discipled by television and marketing, right? Read your news and read widely from multiple sources. So stop watching your news, start reading it. Second, um, I really suggest that you cut back on or simply remove yourself from social media, right? Um, stay out of comment sections. Those are, those are the dregs of humanity these days. Stop sharing and believing memes that have maybe these short quips or two-sentence ideas that trigger an emotional response. Chances are they're wrong or uninformed, right? Social media, by the way, you are the product. You're not the consumer. They are selling your time and emotions to advertisers. I, like, I sit on social media every once in a while. I love social media. I can keep in touch with people who I wouldn't have been able to without it. There are benefits to social media. So if removing it isn't an option for you, that's okay. Cut back on your time on it and avoid getting involved in political conversations on social media. I promise you, you will be spending more time in encouragement and less time in fear and anxiety. If you see something on social media, by the way, that you do want to engage with somebody on, like, oh, I think they're wrong about that, but I want to have a conversation, um, invite them out for coffee or tacos. <laughs> or tacos. Um, <laughs> if they live out of state, FaceTime. Facebook has its own little thing. Fit more, the closer you get to an embodied conversation where you see the image bearer with whom you're having a conversation, the more tender God will make your heart in that moment. Stop bending the knee to golden idols. Finally, in the manner of Philippians 4, think on things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Spend time with God. Avoid, avoid conspiracy theories. Seriously, they don't make you look godly, they make you look foolish. Spend time with God. Read scripture, pray, read some more scripture, pray some more. And then if you want to get involved in spiritually healthy, discerning, and wise manners of politicking, read well. Not just news. I have some suggested readings in your notes if you're curious about places to start. The books that, I rec that I'm recommending are they're easy ways to get into the conversation. You don't have to be an avid reader. You don't have to be an academic to, to read them and understand them. Um, they're shorter. They're really, really good. In her book, The Liturgy of Politics, which is on that list, author and scholar Caitlin Schess says that we are spiritually formed for good or ill by any number of things, but particularly by those things that are repetitive, embodied, and impart a larger meaning. You are what you eat. Are you eating 
of the bread of life or are you eating from the anxiety and fear and partisanship and the golden statues of the world? Okay, coming in for a landing, I promise. The word says that we're exiles in a strange land. First Peter lays it out this way. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, see how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They were accused of doing wrong. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They were accused of doing wrong. Nebuchadnezzar sees God. You and I, we are exiles here. You are not, first and foremost, a citizen of the United States, if you are a believer. Let's say that again. You are not, first and foremost, a citizen of the United States, if you are a believer. You are a citizen of heaven. Some of us, they, people will see us, they'll see our deeds, they'll see our partisanship, yet God is absent because we act just as angry, vitriolic, rude, or just plain mean as the rest of the world because we're demanding they bow the knee at an idol and not at God. The city on a hill ain't the United States, you guys. It's the church. Zion, New Jerusalem, those aren't the United States. As Wendy Witter states in her commentary on Daniel, Babylon is a city that transcends its historical circumstances in the Bible and serves from start in Genesis to finish in Revelation as a metaphor for world power in opposition to God, the empire where God's people live in exile. Friends, we're living in exile in Babylon. And we are called to live holy and righteous lives where our primary and evident allegiance is to God. So a non-anxious witness in a politically volatile world is one that, that responds to the polls of our political candidates, the campaigns, and those seeking to make us fearful and anxious in much the same way as the three men from Judah responded in the only dialogue they're given in this fairly lengthy story. If you have your Bibles open still, it's in, in uh, verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing fire, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods. King James, it says, but if not, let it be known unto thee. The men in Dunkirk knew they would likely die. There was likely personal fear and anxiety in that moment. Loves left unconfessed or unrequited. Families, spouses, children left without a parent. Yet their response was, but if not. We're not ultimately in charge of this world. God enthrones and knocks down kings and emperors and presidents and congresspeople and anybody in a place of power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived as examples of non-anxious witnessing. They lived, they likely felt some fear and trepidation as they felt the heat from that furnace, especially as they were bound and cast in. But if not. Finally, Jesus allowed himself to be taken to the cross and tried as a transgressor to the government, innocent, yet submitting himself to the governing authorities, even at the expense of his life. In doing so, he subverted all governments for all time. He took the keys of Hades, he conquered death and the grave, and the veil was torn as God breathed, and the turn from sin to redemption moved into creation. And Jesus' words call to us from the garden, yet not my will but yours be done. Said another way, but if not, the kingdom of God has inbroken into this world. Let's stop building golden altars or golden statues and telling people to bow the knee. Let's surrender all that we have before Jesus. Let's do good work. Let's be engaged in our community. And let's understand that we can disagree with somebody about political things and glorify God in the process. until the greatest monarchy to ever exist comes in full, 
We must live as non-anxious witnesses in our dual citizenship status, knowing that our hope isn't in a politician or a government official, but in a resurrected Messiah, in a future hope of the completed redemption of creation, the resurrected people standing around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The band can come on up. When you live a life of non-anxious witness, you may be killed, you may be destroyed, you may lose power, you may not have your candidate elected, you may have your worldly kingdom destroyed or taken over, never by Canada. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... But the many kings of their kingdoms of self may see Jesus among you and come to praise his name. And what politician can offer you that? Let's pray. Father, as we go into this new year, I pray that we would cast down the idols that we've built in our lives. I pray that we would listen to the ministering of our brothers and sisters on a daily and weekly basis, and as we see Jesus walking among them, Lord, that we would turn and repent of the idols that we've built in our lives. May we truly exist as the priesthood of believers to the entirety of this world. May this church, this specific church, feel the encouragement that we are living this out already. And may we stand firm on the foundation of the rock of your word, Lord, as the world buffets us back and forth and tries to pull us down tries to make us bend the knee to idols that are not of God. Give us strength and courage. Give us boldness. And may we build our lives always and forever on the truths of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.